the cars roared up. There was obviously a screeching of rubber. George Smith himself grabbed Gordon Lonsdale, put him into the lead car, saying, it's Scotland Yard for you, my boy. This is Cold War Conversations. Massive Soviet military forces have invaded the small, non-aligned, sovereign nation of Afghanistan. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure that you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. This is our second episode with Trevor Barnes, the author of Dead Doubles, a new book on the Portland spy ring, one of the most famous espionage cases of the Cold War. The story continues with the dramatic arrest of three of the KGB spies outside the Old Vic Theatre in London and the discovery of the amazing espionage career of the Krogers, the innocent-looking couple in suburbia. We also talk about the revelation that the Portland spy ring was larger than we thought and that at least two members escaped capture. If you could spare it, I'm asking listeners to contribute at least three US dollars per month to help keep us on the air. Larger amounts are welcome too. Plus, you can get that sought after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a monthly financial supporter. Plus, you bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If you're enjoying our content, then a written review wherever you listen to this podcast would be much appreciated. I'm delighted to welcome back Trevor Barnes to our Cold War conversation. So the intelligence services are forced to roll up the ring because of the imminent defection of Sniper. And the circumstances of the arrest of Lonsdale, Houghton and G are quite dramatic, aren't they? Can you tell me about that? Well, they, they are indeed, and it's fascinating to follow it through. Now, fortunately, it turned out that the defection was on the 4th of January. And on the 7th of January, which was a Saturday, MI5 knew from intercepted correspondence and from the taps on the various phones that Houghton, with almost certainly G, was coming up to London for another meeting with Gordon Lonsdale that weekend. And so here was a heaven-sent opportunity to arrest the spies. And MI5 also knew from looking at the pattern of the way Lonsdale operated with Houghton and G. And by this stage, by the way, the wonderful GCHQ intercepts and decrypting of the messages involving Lonsdale back and forth to Moscow revealed that there were two spies that were talked about, and only two spies talked about in those messages and interchanges with Moscow Centre. One was codenamed Shah, who was Houghton, and the other one was Asia. They knew that there were going to be more secrets, or they thought there were going to be more secrets coming up to London, and they wanted to arrest them. And the background to the arrest was also complicated by the fact that it was surprisingly difficult to actually get the evidence to convict spies in Britain um, in the late 50s and early 60s. There were two or three cases where MI5 um, thought that they had a pretty good case and a jury was not convinced. And so it was terribly important that when they did arrest Houghton and G um, with Lonsdale, that there would be proper evidence in their hands. And the papers reveal, papers being the archives, reveal that there was a, 
a bit of a worry in MI5 about this. And there was even some suggestion that they might try and ensure that certain documents came Harry Houghton's way um, in the days running up to him coming up to London to make sure that he had some documents. Rather surprisingly, in those weeks also running up to the 7th of January, it emerged, and goodness knows how, Harry Houghton had somehow got a key to the security box containing secret documents that were being passed around in Portland. And MI5 and Naval Intelligence in London discovered this, and they decided they would not tell the bosses in Portland this was the case. In their case, they decided to take the key away from Houghton and basically arouse his suspicions and blow any attempt at um, trying to arrest him with documents in his hands. And they decided that they would organize the arrest in two parts. The first part would be um, to organize an arrest outside the old Vic, hopefully, where they had every reason to suspect that uh, Lonsdale would meet up with Houghton and G. And the hope was as well that Houghton and G would have some appropriately secret material. And that would be stage one of the investigation. And that would be stage one of the arrest. And then the plan was to then travel out to Ryslip to arrest the Krogers at the time when Elwell thought Lonsdale would normally arrive at their front door. Of course, the attention also focused on the follow-ups to the exciting events um, in Berlin because when Sniper defected, um, he identified himself, and he arrived in Berlin um, at the end of the 4th of January with a mysterious woman um, who turned out to be his mistress, with whom he'd been having an affair for several years. And the mistress had no idea that Sniper was actually a Polish intelligence officer. She thought that he was a, a Polish journalist who came to East Berlin and um, some other interesting research I uncovered um, with some help from some Polish experts with information, background information about Michael Golanieski and his rise in the Polish intelligence services. But there wasn't room, unfortunately, that, for that in the book. So that's going to be published in a, um, a separate journal later this year, along with other interesting material I found about the man called Rudolf Arbel, who was the character um, um, in the famous film Bridge of Spies, um, played by Mark Rylance. And what I found in my research was the MI5 files about Rudolf Arbel, which no one had really looked at before. And they revealed very intriguingly that MI5, in fact, were pretty alert to Russian illegals in the late 1950s whereas other people thought that they weren't, um, including, I think, John Le Carre, better known as David Cornwall, who tells a story that he went to a, uh, a meeting in the period when he was in MI5 with the head of Soviet counter-espionage, who allegedly, according to John Le Carre, said, oh, and we don't have any Russian illegals, and if we did, we would know their names. And I think based on the documents I've found that that story of Tom McCarry seems highly unlikely and MI5 are actually pretty switched on. But reverting back to the 7th of January, the stage was set and it started um, on the 7th of January at dawn down at the cottage which Harry Houghton lived in at a place called Broadway where there were some watchers positioned and they spotted at 6.30 in the morning his light coming on in his bedroom. And so they immediately passed the message up the line that the day was beginning. He, Harry Houghton, was tailed um, across the isthmus to the Isle of Portland where he picked up Ethel G., and because it was a really, really cold morning 
and there'd also been some really bad weather. Um, they were then tailed into Salisbury, where they were going to take the train, but their train was delayed. So they wandered around the market, then got a late train. And so you can imagine the tension building by this moment um, in London with Special Branch and MI5. And it's important here to make your listeners aware, if they didn't know already, about the important role played by the Metropolitan Police Special Branch in spy investigations at this time. And indeed, they, they still do. Uh, but it was even more important in the um, late 50s, early 60s, because MI5 and MI6 as well were basically not on the radar screen. They were supposed not to exist. Uh, MI5 was known as the war office, if anyone had to refer to it. And in fact, the MI5 secretaries who worked in Leckenfield House at the time, when they were recruited, were told they were going to work in the war office. It was only when they'd been working in MI5 for a few weeks that they realised, in fact, the institution they were working with. And if obviously you've got a secret institution which has no public presence, if they are going to be involved with arresting anyone, it can't be done by MI5. So this is when they would bring in the special branch of the Metropolitan Police to actually carry out the arrests. They were the public face of MI5. They were the people also who would collect the evidence. And if things came to a trial, as it did in this case, as we'll find out in a moment, it would be um, normally a special branch that would give the key evidence because there'd be real problems with the identification of MI5 officers. So a special branch were also involved. They were um, ready and geared up at Waterloo Station because that was where the train that Houghton and G were going to arrive on was expected to appear. The man in charge of special branch operations that day, uh, and their, their operation was called Operation Whisper, was called um, George um, G. Smith. He'd been in special branch quite a long time. He was a very experienced officer, originally came from Wiltshire. And his number two was uh, another intriguing, interesting, very impressive man called Ferguson Smith, who was, in fact, a decorated um, World War II navigator from Bomber Command from World War II. And Ferguson Smith had been traveling um, and getting ready to travel on the same train as Houghton and G, and that's what he did. He accompanied Houghton and G um, on the delayed steam train up from Salisbury when it steamed and hissed into Waterloo Station on that afternoon of the 7th of January. And there were a team of watchers, both MI5 and special branch officers who were in disguise and um, waiting at Waterloo Station. Uh, George Smith himself decided that he'd wear a French beret for some reason, thinking that that would keep him in disguise. But you had um, MI5 watchers who were there as newspaper vendors. Um, others were porters. And they tailed uh, Houghton and G when they arrived out of the station. And um, what they did, uh, and this was a, a cause of alarm at the time, um, Houghton and G didn't immediately go to the old Vic. Instead, they jumped on a bus. And there were, as you can imagine, incredible panic amongst the, um, the watchers at the time. One of them luckily managed to put on a turn of speed and jumped onto the um, old-style deck platform at the back of the London bus and went with Houghton and G. And it turned out that they went to a market uh, about 10, 15 minutes bus ride away. And again, there was more panic on the part of this watcher who'd gone with them because he was all alone and he didn't know where Houghton and G were going to go. But fortunately for him and for the whole operation, Houghton and G wandered through the market, ambled back and got the bus back to Waterloo. As you can imagine, there was a, a mass um, letting out of deep sighs at that moment. And Houghton and G 
walked across to the old Vic and a moment or two later appeared Gordon Lonsdale. So this is obviously an absolutely crucial moment. G was walking along with a shopping bag and Gordon Lonsdale inserted himself. He came up behind the two of them, put his arms over their shoulders, and at that moment he grabbed, in a very gentle, friendly way, the shopping bag from Ethel G. And that was when the arrest took place because George Smith, superintendent of the special branch, he waved a handkerchief, which was a sign to the um, officers around him to move in for the arrests, stood in front of them and said, you're under arrest, I'm from Scotland Yard. And the cars roared up, there was obviously a screeching of rubber. Um, George Smith himself grabbed Gordon Lonsdale, put him into the lead car, saying, and this is in the, the court transcript, saying, it's Scotland Yard for you, my boy. And um, put him in that car. I thought he was going to say, you're nicked or something like that. I thought it was going to be like the Sweeney. It wasn't quite <laughs> as corny as that, Ian, but it wasn't far off. And Houghton and G were obviously separated in separate cars, and they were all whisked off back to Scotland Yard. So part one, phase one of the operation was um, complete. And what um, and this, this is like the Sweeney. This is absolutely true. George, uh, Superintendent George Smith said over the radio intercom those classic words which were code for, I've got them all. He said, lock, stock and barrel. Brilliant. And that was the uh, the code word uh, uh, then passed around to MI5 headquarters, to Elwell, who was waiting, by the way, at um, Lonsdale's flat, along with um, a, a man, who who Winterbourne, who was head of basically the technical department of MI5, that they'd got Houghton, G, and Lonsdale in the bag. And it was time to start thinking about the next stage of the operation. And uh, the three of them were taken back to New Scotland Yard. They were quickly searched. There wasn't much of a time, uh, obviously, for any proper in interrogations. Um, Lonsdale refused to say anything. Um, and um, then revealed an interesting side of his personality because he, he said, and he was a very charming man, Lonsdale. People um, probably don't realise the the way in which he, he, he genuinely made friends with people and charmed and got the respect of, of Elwell uh, in particular, but also George Smith. And uh, he said to Smith, um, I've obviously got a lot of time to spend. Um, is there any chance that anyone could play chess with me? And Smith was so charmed, he, he, he asked around, and there was a police officer who did play chess. And so he was asked to play chess to while away the time with Lonsdale while uh, they went off for the next phase of the operation. Um, Houghton and G um, were both flummoxed and said they'd make a statement later. It, it was all very confusing for them. The important thing for MI5 and Special Branch was to get out to Ryslip in time. So a second wave of cars, the Special Branch one and MI5, then took the A40 road out to Ryslip in northwest London. Uh, the bungalow where the Krogers lived was very close to what's now RAF Northolt. And we can talk a little bit later as to why the Krogers and the KGB might have chosen that bungalow um, for them to be based in. And they came out to this area. And the MI5 note records that the MI5 car in which Elwell was with Hugh Winterbourne arrived three minutes earlier than the special branch cars because um, the special branch cars got lost. What <laughs> um, is revealed from what the son of Charles Elwell told me and anecdotes and, and things, that although relations were very correct and proper between MI5 and Special Branch, to a very great extent, MI5 didn't have that much respect for a number of the officers. 
that worked in Special Branch. They thought they were rather clod-hopping coppers. Not, not all of them, by the way, but there was a, a sense in particular that emerges, in fact, in this case, that George Smith, the Metropolitan Special Branch Superintendent, was rather keen on self-publicity and um, was rather keen to take the glory for a lot of the work which certain people at MI5 felt they frankly should have received more of a share of. But of course, being in the shadows couldn't get. The arrest of the Krogers is, has some drama in it as well. So uh, I think you've got to set the scene that you've got the evening of the 7th of January 1961. It's about seven o'clock in the evening. The street lights have just come on. There's no one really in the streets. It's very quiet. And the moment comes to arrest the Krogers. And Superintendent Smith and his assistant, um, Ferguson Smith, have got no idea what they're going to find. And of course, there's a real risk that if the Krogers suspect that the people who come to the front door are police, they won't, A, open the door. Um, in fact, too, they might even lock it, barricade themselves in and start destroying evidence. They've got no idea also, once they're in, what's going to happen inside. So you can imagine that the heart of Superintendent Smith is beating pretty fast as he knocks on the front door of 45 Cranley Drive. Rice slip, and of course the hallway is dark. The light goes on, and the door is opened. And Special Branch and MI5, by the way, have learned that over the previous few years, while living in that bungalow, and they've lived there since the start of 1956, the Krogers, that they've installed a lot of locks and security mechanisms around the house, telling neighbours that they were fearful of burglars. And obviously you get a couple of these locks that are is undone. And there, standing in the, the hallway, is Peter Kroger. Um, at that stage, he's in his mid-50s. He's got white hair, has um, a, a gentle um, American accent, not as strong as the one of his wife, which is a strong New York accent that she keeps right till the, the day she dies. And the line that Superintendent Smith has decided to use is, can I come in and ask you a few questions? Because there have been a number of burglaries in the area. And so he uses this line and Kroger invites him into the sitting room and then Helen Kroger um, joins them at that moment. And this is when Superintendent Smith sets off his explosive conversational firework by saying, I wish to ask you about um, a guest who comes and visits you um, regularly at weekends. Could you tell me the names of who that might be? And the Krogers are rather kind of, oh my God, you know, something's going on here. So they start rattling off the names of other potential guests, but none of them is Gordon Lonsdale. And so Superintendent Smith uses that as an excuse to arrest them. By the way, he's, he's got a search warrant um, to search the uh, bungalow. So he tells them that they're under arrest and going to be taken to the station. And at that moment, Helen Kroger says, ah, um, can I just stoke the boiler in the kitchen and collect um, a couple of things? And very sensibly, when Superintendent Smith arrives at the bungalow, along with Ferguson Smith, he's also come along with a, a woman police um, officer called Winterbottom, Annie Winterbottom. You could imagine, this is not in the, in the files, but you could imagine that Smith is a bit suspicious. So he nods that she can go off, she, Helen Kroger, but um, makes sure that Annie Winterbottom goes with her. And so Helen Kroger goes into her bedroom and picks up um, her overcoat and also her handbag and then says, uh, goes back into the room uh, where the superintendent is and says, um, can I just go and stoke up the fire? 
because a lot of places at that stage had coal fired burners um, and stoves in the kitchen. Uh, but Superintendent Smith says, uh, before you do that, I need to have a look at your handbag. And by all accounts, there was a bit of a tug of war that went on between Helen Kroger and Superintendent Smith over the handbag, which ended in the superintendent winning. And he opens up the handbag and inside are a couple of really incriminating things. One are some, some slides with micro dots on. These are mini miniaturized photographs of larger documents, which you can transmit. They were so small that they were the size of full stops in books. So they could be inserted in the, into the books, which Kroger would send abroad, for example. So there were these micro dots, but there was also a bit of paper. And this paper was a list of eight roads in southwest London in Kingston. And that piece of paper was, in fact, a crucial bit of evidence that had been found in the safety deposit box of Gordon Lonsdale when it was secretly opened up by MI5 on the 12th of September 1960. Um, and in what was a hollow Ronson cigarette lighter, MI5 had found in a hollow inside it not only this list of eight roads in Kingston, but also some, and this is a really important bit of evidence, the one-time pads, the code pads, KGB issue code pads that have been given to Gordon Lonsdale to enable him to encrypt the radio messages he was sending to Moscow. These two bits of evidence, crucial bits of evidence, were in that handbag. And so Smith had got them. And if Annie Winterbottom had not been as quick on the draw as she was, and indeed Superintendent Smith as well, those two bits of evidence could have been burnt to a cinder in the stove at the back of 45 Cranley Drive. And I think it, in subsequent searches, they find other espionage paraphernalia within the, within the bungalow as well, don't they? They do indeed. I mean, essentially, um, it took quite a while to find all there was. And even then, they didn't find everything. It's quite remarkable. Um, first of all, Special Branch and the Metropolitan Police did a search. They went up into the attic, for example. And at the beginning, Peter Kroger was quite helpful. He even helped show them where to turn the light on into the attic and where the ladder was to get up into it. And up there, they found... Um, a, an aerial, a long aerial that was used for their radio transmissions to Moscow, and it stretched around the inside of the rafters. They also found um, a stash of US dollars, and they found other bits and pieces up there as well. Down in the sitting room, they found their radio that was a standard issue radio, but could receive radio messages from Moscow. But a jewel in the crown they couldn't find. In other words, the radio transmitter for sending messages. They did find um, a microscope in the uh, bedroom of the Krogers. A microscope the, you could you use to read microdots. Uh, they also found, as we've um, already heard, the, the microdots that turned out to be um, messages letters to uh, Gordon Lonsdale from his family and relatives in Moscow. Uh, the other bit of evidence that was found in the handbag, by the way, of Helen Kroger was a piece of paper, and this contained a message written out in Russian. And this was the message that Lonsdale himself had written and wanted sent back, obviously encoded, to his family back in Moscow. Um, and it took over a week before, in the end, Peter Wright and Hugh Winterbourne came and they took over the search down in the cellar. There was a half cellar under the bungalow built in the 30s. And the police had already looked through this and said, we can't find anything. But Winterbourne... 
um, took the, the light which was found, a light with a very, very long 50, 60 foot long lead. And at the beginning, the police couldn't work out what this was for. But when they'd done a search of the bungalow and discovered that in the kitchen, um, underneath the old style gas oven that you could move away, and under the lino of that was a trap door. And that was the way down into the half cellar. And what the police discovered was that if you took that light with that long lead, it was perfect for going down into the cellar and exploring what was down there. Uh, they couldn't find anything. But then MI5 came along again and they did a much more careful search of the cellar. And about six or seven feet away from the trap door, they found some rubble. And when they scraped it away, they found this hardened piece of concrete. And in the middle of it was just the outline of what seemed to be a kind of block that was pushed into it. And they prized that out. And inside was another perfectly hidden hiding place. And inside there were three or four packages carefully wrapped in plastic. And one of those contained the treasure they'd been looking for, the flash transmission radio transmitter. State of the art in 1960, anyway, um, radio equipment, along with in other plastic bags there, a piece of equipment that enabled you to encode messages which if you type them out in morse would take you 15 or 20 seconds to send you can encode them onto a piece of tape put them onto this machine link it up with the radio transmitter and in a flash literally a matter of a couple of seconds a burst of radio transmission would go back to moscow containing the whole of that message and that was what they had found. So immediately, MI5 sent that off to GCHQ. GCHQ's experts took it apart, looked at it, and said, look, this really is state-of-the-art flash transmission equipment. We haven't seen anything exactly like this. We think it's pretty much brand new. We think the Krogers have only had this for probably about eight or nine months. We think they only use it for emergencies or very infrequently. They thought it had only been used probably a handful of times. And you could see why, because it was such a palaver getting it out of the cellar and getting it all set up. Yeah. And if anyone is interested in seeing what it looked like and how it worked, there's a great sequence in the film, the 1963 film called Ring of Spies, where the producers – do a great reconstruction of this bit of equipment being used with the two stars of the film. David Kossoff, in fact, plays the role of Peter Kroger in that 63 film. Yeah, and I also find it quite intriguing that subsequent owners of the bungalow find other bits of espionage paraphernalia whilst they're doing renovations, almost like 10 or 15 years after the arrest of the Krogers? Well, you're absolutely right. Um, when subsequent owners in the early 80s were digging in the garden, they came across, you know, this object hidden, buried in the back garden. And it turned out to be the Krogers' first radio. Um, the Russian sources confirm it was called an Astra radio. And uh, the Russian sources say that Peter Kroger went over to the continent to pick it up from his KGB contact, and he brought it back. And obviously, when that became superannuated and uh, that lived its useful time, the Krogers buried it in the back garden, and it's quite safe there till the early 80s. No, really interesting that that the the other revelation, which was really important. Uh, to note was that after the Krogers were arrested, there was another of the remarkable revelations that keep occurring throughout this story. 
which was that uh, the Krogers were arrested, obviously, under their names. They'd gone around telling neighbours that they were Canadian, but it was found out that, in fact, they had New Zealand passports. But the most remarkable point was that when they were arrested, unlike Lonsdale and Houghton and G, they refused to give their fingerprints over to the authorities. And so the special branch had to get a court order forcing them to provide their fingerprints, which is what they did. And so a couple of days later, the fingerprints were taken of the Krogers. These were taken by special branch back to the fingerprint department at Scotland Yard. And amazingly, within a day or two, there was a perfect match that was made. And it was made against a file of fingerprints sent around the world in February 1958, including to New Scotland Yard and MI5, by America's FBI. And the FBI said, these are the fingerprints of people we strongly suspect of being Soviet spies and linked to Rudolf Arbel, the convicted Russian spy in 1957 in America. And we've been hunting them all around the world and we're enlisting your assistance. And their names are Morris and Lona Cohen. And what MI5 discovered at that point was that when they had caught the Krogers in their net, they hadn't just caught important but relatively small fry, but they caught two enormous mackerel. These were, I say, not just the spies who'd been working with Gordon Lonsdale, but these are spies who the FBI had been searching for for years and had, in fact, been involved in spying um, throughout World War II for the Soviets. And Lona Cohen, in fact, had played a remarkable role in the KGB penetration of Los Alamos, the Manhattan Atomic Bomb Project. It was she who, um, in the middle of August 1945, had gone out to Albuquerque and met the brilliant 19-year-old ex-Harvard physicist called Ted Hall, who'd handed her the first complete plan of the atomic bomb. And this was the woman that MI5 had arrested on the 7th of January, 1961. Yeah, that that is in- incredible. And they are sort of legendary husband and wife espionage pair as well. Now, the, with the court case, Lonsdale doesn't really offer any defence, but he tries to defend the Krogers, doesn't he? Uh, tries to sort of water down their importance. He, he, he does indeed. He essentially tries to take upon himself all responsibility for this and try and get the Krogers off. The Reading the, the transcript of, of the case that was only released um, into the National Archives um, quite recently. It's fascinating because you can see the stenographer recording word for word what's said. And if you then read that together with contemporary accounts of the trial, because there were um, no fewer than three books that were rushed out um, in the aftermath of the trial and these arrests, you get a real sense of the drama in the court and also the strategy that the different defendants were using and essentially they were that Harry Houghton was taking all the blame for FG and trying to say she was an innocent pawn in all of this which backfired terribly and Houghton himself tried to defend himself by saying um, a complete, complete cock and bull story that Gordon Lonsdale um, he thought couldn't possibly be a, a KGB spy um, he was under the illusion that Alec Johnson um, was the name of Gordon Lonsdale, and he was an assistant naval attaché at the American Embassy who was asking him for material from Portland to 
try and test out the British security um, at Portland, which, as you can imagine, didn't go down that well with the jury and, and wasn't likely to be believed. In fact, a contemporary account says that when the story that Houghton elaborated got more and more ridiculous, um, at one moment Gordon Lonsdale starts laughing um, into his hands while he's sitting in the um, in the defendant's box. But the strategy that Gordon Lonsdale adopts is not dissimilar to Harry Houghton. He obviously knew that the Croakers were up to it in the hilt, but he wasn't aware of all the evidence that was going to be deployed against them. And the only strategy he could deploy was to say, and the one he did deploy, was to say, look, I will take it upon myself to say, yes, in effect, I was spying, but you were just innocent friends of mine who I met. And I came at weekends and I, in effect, planted all this spy equipment on you. And none of the three main KGB spies, the ones trained by Moscow, Gordon Lonsdale, whose real identity wasn't known for several months after the trial, and the Kroger's real names, Morris and Lona Cohen. Um, the, the strategy was for Lonsdale to say, I planted all these things there, and for none of the three of them to go into the witness box, of course. They had the right to make a statement, um, but if you make a statement, it's not under oath. And that, that was what they did. So uh, Lonsdale stood up first and said, my friends, the Krogers, they were just innocent pawns and all this. Some stuff may have been found there. I went down into the cellar one weekend while they were away on holiday and I hid my radio equipment there. All the other things that you found around the place were also planted by me. He obviously didn't have a story to cover what was found in Helen Kroger's handbag, but he hoped that the jury wouldn't spot that. And he, by all accounts, according to contemporary journalists who saw him in the witness box, said he he, he cut a, a, a charming and quite convincing figure. Then you had Peter and Helen Kroger. They also went into the stand and um, said that they were innocent, but by all accounts, they weren't that convincing. And then, of course, the jury had to go out and reach a decision and they weren't out for very long. They came back. They found all the defendants guilty. And then there was the next surprise because the judge, who was the Lord Justice of England, no less, handed down some really unexpectedly harsh sentences. So Lonsdale, who he said was clearly the ringleader, got 25 years. Uh, there were gasps around the court when that was announced, but Lonsdale just smiled and just walked down um, into custody. Uh, the Krogers each got 20 years. And then you had the two British spies, Houghton and G. Uh, the Lord Chief Justice said he wasn't convinced by G's story that she was just an innocent pawn in the hands of this manipulative man who whom also she loved dearly, Harry Houghton, um, and gave her and Harry Houghton 15 years um, from remarks made by the Lord Chief Justice. It's possible that Houghton may have got a bit longer, but for the fact that the Lord Chief Justice said that he didn't want to sentence him to such a long time in jail that he'd die in prison. And this is when the next part of the saga begins, which is the attempt to try and persuade the spies to talk and reveal their secrets. One of the first things, you know, what I wanted to talk about was, you know, the attempts to turn Lonsdale, because I understand that he befriended a fellow Russian-speaking prisoner, which doesn't sound like a very clever thing to uh do if if you're a spy but um if you can just outline those early days there and then how he was identified you know how how his real name was identified at the beginning 
Elwell came to visit Lonsdale. And it's clear from various sources that he had immense respect for him as a intelligence officer, clever, cultured, doing his job for his country. Um, Elwell had far less respect for Houghton in particular because he felt that he was a rather grubby individual who betrayed his country, the UK, for money. He wasn't a professional intelligence officer. And early on, Elwell um, went along and he was surprised by the fact that when finally Lonsdale agreed to meet him because um, there was a delay because there was an appeal, the introduction was made via an intermediary because um, Lonsdale indicated he was willing to talk, but that he said, you know, he wanted it to be in great secrecy because he was very afraid that if he was um, to negotiate any sort of deal with the British, this might get back to his superiors in the KGB. And so, um, you had a, a business associate of Lonsdale called Molly Baker, who in fact came along for the first meeting, and it was held in uh, the jail. And in order to try and black out the windows, it turned out the prison authorities had put bits of brown paper over the glass. Lonsdale, by the accounts, wasn't very impressed by this. And there was various discussions that began. Elwell produced a memo in which he, he, in his usual buccaneering spirit, made some quite bold suggestions to his superiors, including whether if Elwell succeeded in getting Lonsdale to talk um, and Lonsdale revealed some genuine secrets, that um, they might be able to, <laughs> this is a really far out idea, could actually get him sprung from jail <laughs> and then um, sent back to the Soviet Union, um, which is a strange echo, of course, of what happened with George Blake, except George Blake did organise a, a jailbreak from Wormwood Scrubs on his own account. Um, needless to say, this very uh, buccaneering idea was knocked down immediately by his superiors, but they um, did agree that if Lonsdale was willing to reveal intelligence of, of value, um, it might be possible to reduce his sentence. And one of the reasons that Elwell was so sympathetic to Lonsdale was the fact that Elwell himself had been imprisoned in Colditz Castle, the famous Colditz Castle in World War II as a prisoner of war because he was captured and he tried to escape. And so he was sent by the Germans to Colditz Castle. So he knew what it was like facing a long, indeterminate, prison sentence and he knew as well that uh, Lonsdale had a family uh, and young children back in in Moscow uh, Elwell by that stage had four young children of his own and negotiations continue it's a bit of an uphill struggle because the Home Office didn't really see the need to be very bold in terms of the offer that was made to Lonsdale uh, Lonsdale indicated, by the way, that any deal he made, he also wanted um, to be shared with the Krogers and that he wanted a deal to be made for them as well because he said they were older than him and he was concerned about them. And so um, there were also negotiations that were carried on by Elwell with the Krogers. But when you read the file, it's clearer that Lonsdale was much more interested and appeared much more open. But he, he said fairly early on in the negotiations, he'd be willing to reveal certain secrets about tradecraft and what went on, but he would not reveal the names of any agents in Britain that he dealt with, open brackets, if there were any, those brackets. Um, to enable the British to arrest anyone and put them on trial. And there would be limits, in other words, to these secrets and intelligence they'd be willing to share. And in the end, 
a deal was done. Um, interestingly, th this document that summarizes the deal that was put to Lonsdale is still a secret. It's still not been released into the archives. Uh, and nor indeed have the MI5 files for the period from February 1961 onwards. In other words, about a month after the arrest. But you can piece together what that deal was. And essentially, it was to offer um, to Lonsdale 10 years off his sentence if he cooperated with British intelligence and answered a questionnaire. And um, you can see in the files a questionnaire that Elwell got together, setting out a series of points about tradecraft, KGB, um, operations in Britain, and what Lonsdale was up to. And the, the background to that deal being put to Lonsdale was also tied up with the second important bit of work that Elwell was doing in 1961 after the trial, which was to work out what was the real name of Gordon Lonsdale. This was really, really important for the British because clearly they had caught this KGB illegal and they wanted to find out who he really was, um, partly in order to see what else they could glean in terms of what role he'd played in Russian intelligence, but also as um, a way they hoped of putting leverage on Gordon Lonsdale to cooperate with the British. How did the real identity of Gordon Lonsdale get established? It's a fascinating story. Uh, the first stage was to establish that in a way that's completely beyond doubt, that the man who was masquerading under the name of Gordon Lonsdale, um, a Canadian born in 1924 in Cobalt, Ontario, with um, a Canadian passport who had, um, on the basis of his birth certificate um, as Gordon Lonsdale, got a Canadian driving licence and a Canadian passport and come to Britain that man who had lived under that name and then had sold jukeboxes and lived as a Canadian businessman in Britain was not that person. And the important work was done here by the Canadians, by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And what they did was track down the real father of the real Gordon Lonsdale, who was still living in northern Canada and found out an absolutely crucial event um, surrounding that young boy's birth. And what the Canadians found out was that soon after he was born, little Gordon Lonsdale, of whom uh, the Canadians found photographs with his mother as a little baby, by the way, um, had been circumcised. And when this bit of news emerged, of course, um, it enabled um, Superintendent George Smith of Special Branch to order a medical examination at the end of January 1961 of Gordon Lonsdale in jail. And surprise, surprise, he was not circumcised. So stage one, because this uh, little lad had, had been circumcised, and this is obviously a crucial fact that the KGB were not aware of when they gave this um, new legend, this new identity to Gordon Lonsdale. Um, so that was not known to the KGB. They couldn't put it right, only at the expense of an incredibly painful operation on the adult um, man pretending to be Gordon Lonsdale. Because of that, they established beyond doubt that Gordon Lonsdale in jail in Britain was not the man with the passport. But the stage to follow that the even trickier one was to establish who he really was. And this is where you had a combination of luck and good old style gumshoe detective work by the FBI um, came to the rescue. Stage one, as you referred to, was the fact that 
um, fairly early on when he was in Wormwood Scrubs in a moment of carelessness, I suppose, and, and trust, perhaps a momentary moment of, of loneliness, one never knows. Um, Gordon Lonsdale found there was a, a fellow prisoner who spoke Russian, and he, this prisoner um, who was with Lonsdale, said, well, perhaps he might be able to help him get a message to his mother. And Lonsdale mentioned that his mother lived in Zubovsky Boulevard in Moscow. And so this detail came out and was passed on to MI5. And one of their Soviet experts had a look at it and said, well, it's all very well. And they got um, probably MI6 in Moscow. We don't quite know how to look in the... Um, look around, make some inquiries. And also in London, they looked in the Moscow um, telephone directory for all the phone numbers in Zubovsky Boulevard, and there was no name there that was a link with Gordon Lonsdale, because, of course, they only at that stage had his English name. But the next stage was um, a clue, really, and this is an interesting indicator of the way in which Charles Elwell really was a superlative counterintelligence officer with a keen uh, gimlet eye for detail, but also the sort of creative ability to understand that you could make connections with things. Um, in interviewing various girlfriends of Lonsdale, one of them said that because he, he entertained a lot of girlfriends, he, he was, I think, less successful with them in terms of seducing and having sex with them than he gave um, his friends back in Moscow to understand when he went back to Moscow in the following years. But he, he did, because he was a charming man, have a really wide social network. And one of these girlfriends said that she went to a film one night with Lonsdale and the film featured California. And he talked a lot in what seemed like very knowledgeable detail about San Francisco. Now, early on in the inquiry, the FBI had, um, at the end of 1960, um, been doing some inquiries across America, partly in connection with, um, with um, trying to locate where... Um, Cohen's, we now knew to be the Krogers, uh, the Cohen's had gone when they had left New York in the early 1950s and not said where they'd gone, uh, but also to follow up on Rudolf Arbel and, and, and things, um, and also the mysterious Gordon Lonsdale, had made some inquiries um, in the San Francisco area, but no one had heard of a man called Gordon Lonsdale. But the... The breakthrough came when this friend of Lonsdale's had said he remembered a lot about San Francisco. And so the FBI at that moment reopened the files and went around the schools in the San Francisco area. And they went to one school and the retired principal remembered. She said, yeah, we, we did have a, a Russian who came and studied in this school in the 1930s, and his name was Conon Molody. And that was the crucial breakthrough. They had a name. They started to develop the file on this young man called Conon Molody. They talked to his relatives, his cousins, and they tracked down his aunt, um, and everything came together. And the final pieces of the jigsaw came into place in Paris when um, Owell was putting together the complete family tree of this man, Conon Molody, and interviewed his aunt, who was a ballet teacher in Paris, a woman called Tatiana Piankova. And this is all done with the FBI. And you realised when you read all this through in this incredibly detailed family tree that you can see in, in the archives in, in Kew, that indeed 
Konon Trofimovich Molody was the man. And there's remarkable piece of police detective work that was put together in establishing who he was. And so finally they had nailed the identity of this man. And then this tracks back to making the deal with him because the assessment of Elwell and MI5 was that if they could leak the real identity of this man, the KGB would think that Molody, MI5 knowing his real identity, would be far more likely to cooperate with the British and start telling them secrets. And so they, and this is all in the files, it's absolutely remarkable, decided to covertly organise a leak of the fact that they had identified the man who was masquerading under the name of Gordon Lonsdale. And they would do this with the help of the FBI in California, expecting that story to be picked up and echoed in Europe and reported in the British newspapers so that Elwell could go into the jail, surprise Gordon Lonsdale with the hope that Lonsdale, whose real name was Colin Molody, would then basically keel over and start revealing secrets. And the leak went ahead, but it didn't work. And you can see the memo where uh, Elwell goes along, uh, reveals um, the fact that the identity has been published expecting to find Molody is nonplussed, but cool as a cucumber. Uh, Molody just sits there and shrugs his shoulders and in effect says, well, I was expecting this to happen at some stage. And then a few weeks later when Elwell comes along with the deal, you know, the offer of 10 years of his sentence, Lonsdale just dismisses it offhand and decides he's not going to have anything further to do with a possible deal with the British government. And he's certainly not going to betray the Soviet Union. He was clearly expecting a much more bold deal from the British, possibly being allowed to return to the Soviet Union within two or three years at, at most. And that was never on the cards. And that surely would have raised the suspicions of the KGB if he'd been released that quickly. Well, that's my view. Um, my assessment, thinking it all through, is that, frankly, a deal was never really on the cards because the British would only really let him out really quickly if not only did Conor Molody reveal some real secrets about who his other agents were, and um, I've uncovered evidence putting it all together which suggests that the network of agents he ran was considerably more important and wider than just the Portland spy ring. Um, he, he would need to, in effect, agree to become a double agent for the British. And in fact, there was some discussion about this with Elwell by Lonsdale. Lonsdale sort of floats the idea that if he went back early to Russia and the Russians decided that he'd betrayed them, the Brits would organise uh, an exfiltration of him from the Soviet Union, which is a fascinating echo, of course, of what happened with Oleg Gordievsky yeah. back in the 1980s. Um, and there's no detailed discussion about that. But Lonsdale also says, you know, I, I, want, I want a pension. You know, there, there, the whole discussion is fascinating because um, you, you get hints suggesting that Lonsdale, Conor Molody was quite serious. But then... When it comes to actually making an offer that's going to work, you realise that it's not going to happen. And you're right. I mean, if he had gone back early, it's highly likely that, you know, the KGB would have been understandably suspicious and that um, Molody could have disappeared without trace, having been executed um, by a firing squad somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So in 1962, a British businessman gets arrested in Moscow, Greville Wynne, who is a courier for Penkovsky, who is a uh, a British agent in the Soviet military. And that opens up the option for a potential spy swap. 
indeed. And again, the new documents reveal um, the sort of background story to that, whereby you've got a uh, correspondence that opens up with Lonsdale in jail and uh, with a Polish lawyer who they, the KGB in effect invented a completely false family for, for Lonsdale um, based in Poland. And this enabled them to start writing letters to Lonsdale while he was in jail. And according to George Blake, who met Lonsdale Molody in Wormwood Scrubs in early on 1961, and he was allowed in those early days to have several meetings and chats with Lonsdale. Lonsdale was always pretty confident that a spy swap might happen. But the, the story of the swap itself is quite interesting because the Russians were very adept at manipulating the Western media about the story about um, Greville Wynne and his declining health. And this is uh, charted um, in a couple of academic articles. It's very interesting. But ends up with the fact that they plant stories in British newspapers. And the net result is it puts pressure on the British government to get the spy swap organised. And in the end, um, it's going to happen. But it's intriguing because the Brits have not actually had to organise a spy swap before. And you can see how in the files, because it's a completely new set of circumstances, um, the British have to start negotiating with the Russians well how do we do it? Because, of course, the British were very suspicious of uh, what the Russians' intentions might be. In fact, there's a fascinating document I found with a comment from Douglas Hume saying, well, um, how do we be, how can we be sure that when Wynne is released, he isn't poisoned by the Russians, <laughs> that um, he isn't, um, you know, attacked or killed on the way home? In other words, we do the swap and then we get our man back, but you know, he dies. And again, there are some really eerie echoes here of things like the Skripal case, you know, and the, the poisoning in, in Salisbury. But the, the funniest moment, I think, is when um, the British ambassador is instructed to contact the European Department of the Foreign Ministry of Russia to say... Um, He's been instructed to start discussions about the release from jail of Gordon Lonsdale. And the response of the, uh, the woman, because it's a woman in the Russian foreign ministry, is, who is Gordon Lonsdale? <laughs> and obviously the, the British diplomat's completely taken aback. But um, after various options are discussed about, you know, should this swap take place in Poland? In the end, it's decided it will take place in um, uh, early in the morning in April in 1964. And the, there's no advance warning given to Molody in jail. Um, one morning, he's simply given 15 minutes to get his stuff together. Um, he says farewell to the governor and there's a fascinating document by the MI5 officer who accompanied Lonsdale all the way from Birmingham jail because that's where he was at the moment down to um, of all places RAF Northolt where he's going to be flown off to the RAF base at Gatow um, in in Western controlled Germany at the time, ready for the spy swap. And it really reads like a novelist account how charming um, Lonsdale was. And it's also remarkable because it records the immediate response of Lonsdale when he's told that he's going to be freed. And when he's first told, he isn't overcome with joy, you can see a sense of kind of shock 
and momentary horror because he clearly doesn't know what the hell is going to happen to him when he's back in the Soviet Union. But he quickly clicks himself together and realizes that this is what's been decided and he'd better go along with it. And that's what happened. So they're driven down the newly, relatively newly opened M1. And in one of those bizarre coincidences again, they drive through Ryslip and they pass by the end of Cranley Drive. <laughs> and it's at that moment that Lonsdale says, oh, and by the way, we selected the bungalow there for the Krogers to live in because we thought the radio traffic would be more easily hidden by all the RAF and other um, radio traffic of the airfield. <laughs> and then they drive on onto the tarmac, and that's where the MI5 man says farewell to Gordon Lonsdale, who's obviously passed into the care of an unnamed MI6 officer. Um, he boards the plane, and off they go. And they arrive in uh, RAF Gatow. He spends the night, and then a crack of dawn the next morning, um, they're taken to um, the relevant Herstrasse Bridge, as it was there, not the Glienicke Bridge. And the exchange takes place um, uh, a little after five in the morning. And there's a photo in the book um, taken on the Soviet side of the moment of the exchange, um, taken at quite a distance, but it's nonetheless quite interesting to see it. Yeah, no, it is. It is indeed. Now, the Krogers are part of a, a swap as well, which we won't go into a, a lot of detail. So they're, they're swapped in 1969. So they serve another uh, five years more than Lonsdale. But it was interesting yep. what, what you said earlier about the fact that, you know, that there was not necessarily evidence, but indications that Lonsdale did have a wider ring. And um, I think Christopher Andrew has mentioned that he he believes that the ring numbered more than the five that who who were arrested. Well, it's it's been known ever since Vasily Matrokin um, defected to the West in the early nineties with his archive, and Chris Andrew published the two volumes of the Matrokin archive. Um, that there was at least one other spy, and this was pretty much established as fact. Um, the woman known as Melita Norwood, the granny spy, the spy who came in from the co-op, um, who was a remarkably successful um, agent for the Soviet Union, a convinced communist. But according to Matrokin's look at the archive, she was only controlled by Gordon Lonsdale for about five weeks. Um, and she didn't like the playboy image that Gordon Lonsdale projected. He was too lightweight, not a convinced enough a stalwart signed up member of the Communist Party for her liking because she was quite puritanical, I think, from that point of view. And so she went back in terms of control to someone from the Russian embassy. Uh, but what was quite intriguing going back over things was, was piecing it all together. And there is no, I emphasize this quite carefully, there is no irrefutable evidence of this being true uh, because um, there's no evidence released in the British archives um, and the KGB archives um, are still closed. When I first made contact with the press bureau of the current equivalent of the first chief directorate of the KGB, i.e. the, the foreign part, uh, the equivalent, if you like, of MI6 or CIA, um, to see if there might be any assistance they could help me with. Uh, and I went and visited them. The first answer was, as regards, can I have access to the archives? Um, it's very serious and solemn, yet. And so um, I knew I wasn't going to be able to do that. But if you piece together everything, I think it's pretty much beyond reasonable doubt that there was a successful penetration of Port and Down the Chemical and Biological Warfare Research Centre of Britain, just near Salisbury, and that certainly a number of secrets of Britain's 
chemical and biological weapons were passed to the Russians via what seems most likely Lonsdale and the Krogers. And that um, also, for example, some of the secrets and the details of CS gas, which was first developed by the British there, were passed to the Russians in that way. And then again, another eerie echo of what's been going on in recent years. It's worth pointing out that the British were the first to synthesize a VX nerve agent um, of the type which became the Novichok nerve agent weapon used in Salisbury. It was a direct forebear of that. And that was first synthesized in Britain and um, developed further important down with uh, the cooperation of the Americans and the Canadians. And there's also work done on various other types of biological weapons. And I theorize, I can't say more than that, that of those most valuable chemical and biological, bacteriological secrets passed to the Russian, that VX, details of that VX and that nerve agent may well have been one of the most important secrets that were passed over to the Russians. It's not clear who the agent or agents was. There is an important defector to the West called Alexander Kuzminov, who's written a book called Bacteriological Espionage. And I was in contact with him, and he indicated he might be willing to talk to me, but that was just before the Skripal poisoning. <laughs> and immediately after the Skripal poisonings, I contacted him again, and he learned I had been to Moscow, because I'd been to Moscow researching. He, for understandable reasons, I have to say, he cut off all contact with me. I theorize again that that, you know, cause and effect doesn't take much to put two and two together to think that he'd been warned to protect his security even more tightly after the terrible events in Salisbury. Yeah. Then in the Russian sources, they mention a mysterious Agent K, whose description in the official history of the SVR, that's the name now of the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, does not match that of Alita Norwood. And this spy seems to have passed important other information. Also, the Russian sources talk about details of Britain's rocket, the Blue Streak, which came to an ignominious end because we ran out of money to fund it. But we were doing quite serious rocket research in this country. And also the fact that Lonsdale apparently um, gave to the Russians some other important industrial secrets uh, about the way of making sort of materials used in aeronautics and that sort of thing. So, uh, and that can only have happened, I think, if there was a wider network. And indeed, when Lonsdale first started talking to Elwell, he did say to him that one of the things he would talk about if he cooperated was another illegal network he was running in Britain. So if you add all these tantalizing clues together, I think beyond reasonable doubt, the network was larger than just Harry Houghton and Nethel G. Um, even though the only evidence that MI5 collected was about Houghton and G. One of the abiding mysteries of the case is if uh, Lonsdale was running other agents. He could, of course, had meetings with them separate to the surveillance that was being followed by MI5 because it emerges from the inquest into the case. Roger Hollis admits that the MI5 watchers had limited resources and could not follow all the Russian spies 24-7 successfully. So I, it's perfectly possible, I think, that Lonsdale did have other networks that he was linked with, other agents he was meeting or communicating with, other than Houghton and G, and he kept them separate, possibly because he was concerned that his security might have been compromised, or he was simply having a separate set of networks for good tradecraft to ensure that if you compromised by one, 
it wouldn't compromise another one. Yeah, intriguing, intriguing. There could be volume two. Well, I certainly hope that MI5 uh, and their, um, by all accounts, incredibly hardworking history team will release the final tranche of Kroger documents from February 1961 onwards. I, I fear that might be partly because it's very voluminous because I put in a Freedom of Information request to the FBI for their files about the, the Coens. And I was advised by sources in the FBI to cut back my request because originally it would have involved, they estimated, wait for it, 19,000 documents. And we have further photos, videos and information on this episode in our show notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Don't forget, if you'd like to get one of those Cold War Conversations coasters, help keep us on the air, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If you can't wait for the next episode, do visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Thanks again to all our financial supporters of the podcast, but a special thanks to our Politburo level Patreons, who are Sam Hardwick, Nicholas Butter, and Jeffrey Jones, who are supporting us at 30 US dollars per month. Thank you.